A recent report from Food Banks Canada says Nova Scotia is failing people who are living in poverty. We received the lowest possible overall grade, an F, and we are the only province to score so low. The report notes that Nova Scotia last wrote a poverty reduction strategy in 2009 and has not updated it since. It says more than half of Nova Scotians feel worse off compared to last year, and almost a quarter are experiencing food insecurity. We also know we're dealing with the cost of living, a housing crisis, and many that are struggling. One way that is pitched to reduce poverty is the introduction of a guaranteed basic income. Earlier this week, we spoke to Senator Kim Pate, who is championing a bill that is working its way through the Senate. It supports a framework for a guaranteed livable basic income. It's not a new idea, but it's one that is gaining traction across the country again. And our neighbor, Prince Edward Island, is being pitched as the ideal demonstration site. The CBC's Rose Murphy has been talking to a number of people about the idea, and she's here now to tell us more. Hi, Rose. Hi, Carolyn. So first of all, let's clarify exactly what we mean by a basic income guarantee or a universal basic income. So we're talking about a universal guaranteed income. It would be available to everyone who needs it, regardless of whether they're working or not. You wouldn't have to prove your need or show that you're looking for work. The only test would be your income level. The big thing here is that the amount provided must be a livable income. For instance, the minimum wage in Nova Scotia right now is not enough to live on. Many of the people I spoke with pointed out that the idea actually shouldn't be that foreign to us. This is Jane Ledwell, an advocate for a basic income guarantee on PEI. We do have working programs that are similar to basic income guarantee or that are basic income guarantee in Canada already. The Canada Child Benefit is essentially a basic income for children. The Old Age Security program with the Guaranteed Income Supplement ensures a basic income for people over 65. So we're really only talking about expanding our understanding of minimum income or a a guaranteed income for uh, working age people, for people who are older than children and younger than seniors. So that's Jane Ledwell. She's the executive director of the PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women, and her organization has been working towards a basic guaranteed income for 20 years now. So walk us through this. What is the argument for a basic guaranteed income model? Well, for most advocates, it starts with an ethical or moral premise that everyone has the human right to have their basic needs met and to live with dignity. But advocates say it also has huge social and economic impacts. Uh, I spoke to Elizabeth K. Reiningbird. She's the chair of the group Basic Income Nova Scotia. She's also on the planning committee for an Atlantic-wide basic income group and on the steering committee for the national organization Coalition Canada Basic Income Revenue Debat. Here she is explaining part of why she believes in a basic income guarantee program. Income is, I would argue, the most important social determinant of health. If people have enough money to buy nutritious, healthy foods that they need, then food insecurity is largely treated. That's Elizabeth K. Reiningbird. What do we know about how much food insecurity costs us as a society? Well, in one of the case studies that Raining Birds organization recently put out, they show that being severely food insecure shortens people's lives by nine years, and that severely food insecure people cost the healthcare system twice as much as a person who can afford enough healthy food does. And that's just one of the areas of benefit. Research also shows that these programs can significantly reduce mental health issues and health care visits, especially for accidents and mental health-related issues, and that rates of abuse and crimes due to desperation also decrease significantly. And as the Food Banks Canada report made painfully clear, our existing poverty reduction efforts are failing miserably, and poverty is expensive. Okay, but haven't we tried basic income programs before? Yeah, there have been experiments, but most of them have been either quite short term or targeted at specific groups. So you might remember the pilot project that began in Ontario in 2017 and was canceled after one year with a change in government. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're still learning a lot from these short term experiments. 
So for instance, in BC in 2018, a peer-reviewed study conducted by the Charity Foundations for Social Change in partnership with UBC gave 50 recently homeless people in Vancouver a lump sum of $7,500 and told them they could do whatever they wanted with the cash. They also set up a comparison group, so other recently homeless people who were not given any money. What did they learn from that? So the 50 people who were given the cash moved into housing faster and saved the shelter system over $8,000 per person over the year. So that's a total savings of almost $414,000. That's more than the value of the cash transfers. So it means those cash transfers paid for themselves and actually saved the broader society money. And we learned something else from this study that I think is both really important and kind of heartbreaking. They also asked 1,100 people to predict what they thought homeless people would do with the money they were given. And most people predicted they would buy more drugs and alcohol, but the study proved them wrong. Instead, people spent the money on food, clothing, rent, and they moved into stable housing faster and even saved enough money to maintain financial security over the entire year of follow-up. One of the common arguments against basic income programs is that you're basically paying people to stop working. Are we wrong about that as well? Yeah, according to the research, that's not really a problem. One of the best test cases that we have was a research program that studied minimum income in the town of Dauphin, Manitoba from 1974 to 1979. That's one of the questions that they were setting out to answer. Would a guaranteed annual income cause people to leave the workforce? Here's Elizabeth K. Rainingbird. With a basic income, the amount of the benefit goes down gradually as earned income increases. And so people can always do better financially if they do work. And so often... Uh, they will continue to work. But people who choose not to work when they receive a basic income tend to fall into two categories. One of them is people who choose to go to school or go back to school or finish school or get additional training. Another one is people who choose to care for loved ones, children, people who are are ill in their family, etc. So that was Elizabeth K. Rainingbird. In general, studies around the world show that people don't stop working, and instead, it often allows them to secure better and more meaningful jobs. And I think it's worth noting, advocates say basic income programs also recognize and support traditionally unpaid labor, so like child care and elderly care, as well as precarious labor like entrepreneurship, seasonal work, and working in the arts. So they've also tried programs like this in other parts of the world. You looked into a program in Ireland that was directed at artists. What did you learn there? Yeah, while I was looking into this, a friend was visiting from Ireland, and she mentioned that her brother is on a basic income scheme there right now. So I gave him a call. My name is Aidan Duffy. I'm a musician, music producer. I work on my own music. I play in bands with others, and I'm currently producing music in my own studio with some clients as well. So that was Aidan Duffy in Trim, County Meath, Ireland. And the Irish program is similar to programs that they're also testing in San Francisco and New York. How is it working in Ireland? So basically, people had to demonstrate that they were working in the arts to be entered into a lottery. 2,000 of the qualifying artists and musicians were selected at random, and they're now being given a guaranteed basic income for three years. No strings attached in terms of their output. So they're following these artists on the program, and they're following another 1,000 artists who are not receiving the basic income to see how they all fare. So that data isn't available yet. They're still kind of in the middle of year one. Um, But they're tracking things like the state of their finances, if they can afford to heat their homes, what happens with their artistic careers, and with their health. Here's Aiden again. I would say the impact has been a sense of security and a sense of support to engage in the kind of art that I think is really meaningful, rather than be stuck with pressure to take what I can to fill my days and make enough money. It's made that difference to be able to focus on what really matters in in music and in the arts. And that was Aidan Duffy in Trim, Ireland. Okay, but back to Atlantic Canada, the government is already struggling to figure out how to deal with the housing crisis, inflation, food insecurity. How do we pay for a basic income program? 
So the Basic Income Canada Network has developed affordable models for funding a basic income guarantee. They say it's possible to fund the program without increasing government expenditures just by modifying federal and provincial tax credits to benefit those who really need them. Basically, the advocates say, yes, it will cost money, but as we've been discussing, it costs us money to keep people in poverty, too. And if everyone's basic needs were met, costs for things like health care, policing, incarceration, the justice system would all go down. So all the people you've spoken to seem to feel there is a real momentum building across the country. And there's a lot of support for using PEI as a demonstration site. Why there? Well, for one thing, the entire province could participate, and it's such a small population, it's comparable to a city in Ontario. And for another thing, it's one issue where all the PEI political parties are actually on board. Here's Jane Ledwell again. So the Special Committee on Poverty in PEI, at the end of its deliberations and hearing from the public and hearing from experts, they determined that 40% of islanders would receive some level of benefit from a basic income guarantee. That was before the pandemic. That was before two major hurricanes. That was Jane Ledwell. And both Jane and Elizabeth K. Rainingbird stressed that this shouldn't be another short-term experiment. They say we really need five to seven years to see all the wide-ranging benefits. And they really want PEI to be a demonstration site. So that's the place where the program is sort of tweaked and then it's rolled out across the country, kind of the same way that Saskatchewan was the first to implement universal health care in 1947. Why do you think this idea is making such a comeback right now? Well, advocates say it's the one thing we could actually do, backed by research, that shows that it could help us address so many of the struggles that people are experiencing right now. And I think it's worth noting again that in the Dauphin, Manitoba experience during the study, they saw the demand on healthcare systems decreased significantly, lower rates of domestic violence, less injuries, and lower rates of mental illness than in surrounding areas. Here's Jane Ledwell in PEI. I mean, it's possible to enumerate the economic cost, but the the moral cost, the social cost, it's unacceptable that anyone in a place like PEI that has so much, it's unacceptable that anyone should have to live in poverty. And that was Jane Ledwell, part of the group working towards the basic income in PEI for 20 years now. All right. Thanks so much, Rose. Thank you.